Right. Recording is on. Good morning and welcome everyone to our class BC212 on Christian apologetics. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for the opportunity once again to uh, get together like this and take some time to study and learn. Uh, we ask for the inspiration of your spirit, the work of your spirit in our hearts and minds as we consider these things that which we are about to learn and equip us uh, to be able to speak lovingly and clearly into the hearts and lives of people and point them to Jesus. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go today to lesson number three. We're going to start talking about faith and science. Now, um, some of the lessons that we see, uh, you know, for the, for the next few weeks uh, would be, you know, uh, leaning on the side of, you know, this whole science, talking about science and how that matters to us. So uh, it may be a little complicated, but don't worry. Okay. Um, we will, you know, this is part of what we will be covering in uh, apologetics for the benefit of uh, uh, those of us who may need to respond to these kinds of questions. Okay. So we want to start by asking this question Does science contradict the Christian faith? That means if you are a believer, believe in God. Uh, you believe in the Bible, you believe in, you know, the things of the Spirit, doesn't mean that we cannot be scientists or that we cannot study science, right? So sometimes people think that science and a belief in God are opposites. Or they, they don't match. But actually, that's not true. You can be a believer in God and also be a very good scientist. Because in your mind, science is a study of God's creation. You're just studying what God created. You're exploring the things that God has put in his world. So it's not against your faith. It actually enhances your faith. It makes your faith even more strong. It makes your worship of God even more richer. So, wow, God is so great that He could create all these things. He could make all these things. So, for a believer, studying science, exploring these things is not a contradiction. It is a good thing. It makes us more amazed of God. Right? And what we actually see is that uh, many of the scientists in the early days, when we go back in time, they were actually believers in God. Only today, in modern times, it's almost like if you're a scientist, you don't believe in God. That is not true. If you go back a few hundred years, uh, all the early scientists, they were all strong believers in God. And they saw that stud the study of science is all just an exploring exploration of God's creation. Right? So if you look at some names that are mentioned in your notes there on page 12, uh, Johannes Kepler, he was an astronomer and a mathematician. And uh, he studied all about you know, astronomy and planets and so on. For him, uh, he was a Lutheran, Christian. And he saw his study as a way of understanding how great God is, the mind of God. Galileo, he was a physicist, a mathematician, and an astronomer. And he was a devout Catholic. And he, uh, you know, he he's the one who came up with this, uh, you know, or rather he was supported this idea that the earth revolves around the sun. Uh, 
Uh, and at, at that time, there was, you know, uh, there's a uh, you know, early days. At that time, people thought the earth was flat and all those things, you know. So slowly they learned, you know, they discovered so many things. So uh, Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician. He's a physicist and an inventor. He was also a Catholic. And he, you know, he contributed uh, a lot to uh, physics and uh, fluid mechanics. And he also wrote on theology, on his faith in God. He also wrote about that. Isaac Newton, mathematician, physicist, uh, he came up with the laws of motion and gravitation. And he was a strong believer. He saw his scientific work as an understanding of God's creation. And even Newton wrote, not only did he do a lot of work in science, he also wrote a lot of theology. You know, so they were expressing their faith in God. Robert Boyle was a chemist, a physicist, and he was also a devout Christian. And he also gave, uh, uh, you know, uh, lectures defending Christianity against atheists and skeptics. Copernicus was a mathematician, astronomer, and uh, he came up with how the solar, the model of the solar system, how the planets uh, uh, in our solar system are revolving around the sun. Uh, you know, we don't know too much about his faith, but he was a Catholic. Uh, he was part of the Catholic Church. G Gutenberg was an inventor, a printer, who discovered the printing press, or invented the printing press. Uh, he also, I mean, part of his, his invention was to help print religious books, the Bible, and so on. So even though he was an inventor and a printer, his strong his faith uh, in God was very important uh, to him. So here's just a small list uh, of uh, scientists from the early days. And even today in the world, there are good scientists who also believe who are also strong Christians. One very well-known person is John Lennox. Uh, you can see his uh, videos on YouTube. Um, so uh, he's a scientist, but he also speaks up for the Christian faith. Uh, so like that, there are many others, of course. Um, they will, you know, and, and, and their voices are important because uh, they are established in their fields. You know, they are accomplished in their fields as scientists. So when they speak and you know, they express their faith, then a lot of people respect them, so they listen to them in the, in the scientific community. Right? So uh, what, we, what we believe, uh, let's look at some scriptures. Psalm 115, verse 16. Psalm 115. Verse 16, it says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So everything belongs to God. The heavens belong to God. The earth he has given to us. So we live here. We explore. We study. Study. Earth he has given to us. It's, it's for you. You research, you study, you learn, you make use of these things, right? So we understand that, that uh, we are responsible for the earth, and part of it is in our learning and discovering of how things work on the earth so that we can take care of it. Uh, we can also make use of it for our benefit. In Isaiah 28, it's a very interesting passage. Isaiah 28, verses 23 to 29. Isaiah 28 23 to 29. It's talking about the farmer, but it's quite interesting. Isaiah 28, 23 onwards. Give ear and hear my voice, listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? 
when he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat and rose, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? Verse 26. For he, that is God, instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever. Break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. So notice verses 26 and 29. So it's talking about the farmer. How does a farmer know what to do? Who taught him? You know, now you think about it back maybe, you know, some thousands of years when they first started farming. Okay, they plowed the ground, then they sowed the seed, then they watered it. Those days there was no agricultural university. There was no college to go and learn all these things. So where did they understand now how to sow the seed, how to harvest, then how to separate the grain from the, the rest of the thing? How, they, how did the farmer get that intelligence? So what this passage is saying is, verse 26, God instructs him in right judgment, his God teaches him. God taught the farmer how to do this. Again it says, verse 29, this comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. So for man to learn how to make use of what is there, God taught him. God gave him that understanding. Starting from thousands of years, when they first started farming. Today, we might be doing other discoveries, you know. Okay, how you get electricity, uh, you know, how you get other things, so many things. How, you know, that study, that research is empowered by God. As long as we put it to good use. Right? Now, of course, similarly, man is also studying how to <laughs> do wrong things, you know, how to make bombs, how to destroy other people. <laughs> but that is... Man using this to for destruction, which is not, of course, it's not, uh, you know, good. But we are talking about the discovery of things in creation, that God is involved in all of that, in helping us discover. How do you know, you know, what medicine to give for different diseases? They they study in the lab. They're researching. You know, they are okay. This is uh, this disease is caused by this virus or this thing. So how to attack that? No, we can do this. So God is giving us that intelligence to study. Right? This comes from God for the benefit of humanity, people, for all of us. So even in science, in research, God is involved. We don't see it as something separate from God. No, we see it as God is helping us learn about His creation. God is saying, I'll show you what I've put inside. I'll show you. I'll open your eyes. I'll give you understanding. I'll show you. Right? So God is helping us in that process. So that is how we see it. Right? Uh, and we also mentioned in Romans 1.20, we read this before. I'll go, go, go to it again. Romans 1 and verse 20. Romans 1 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. God's attributes are seen. 
and his power is seen in his grace. So when we are actually doing research and learning about things, we're actually seeing the attributes of God. We are seeing his power. You know? So, you know, when we research about, the, you know, astro example, astronomy is studying about planets and stars, and then we say, okay, this one star, sun, is so powerful, so much of energy coming, you know? It's like, wow, God must be so much bigger than that. You know, one sun, one star is so powerful, and there are billions or millions of these stars. Imagine how powerful God must be. Yeah? So, through His creation, we are getting a glimpse of His power. How, how great He must be. So, for us, the study of science, uh, and research and all of that is not against our faith. We believe God is involved and He's encouraging us, He's helping us learn. So, what about so what about discoveries made in science that cannot be explained by biblical accounts? So, obviously, there are a lot of things that science has that are not in the Bible. The Bible is not an encyclopedia has all the names of all the plants and animals. It's not so. so obviously, you will find so many things that are not in the Bible. It's okay. doesn't matter. Bible doesn't claim to be, uh, this is a list of everything God created. No. Only gives us a few things. This is how God created. Fine. So, we will, uh, science will discover many things. It's okay. It doesn't, ch doesn't change anything. God created it. Bible is not a complete book of everything that God created. It's not an encyclopedia. It's just telling us that fact that God created it. This is how He created. He did these things. So it's okay. Yeah. So, if by example to say, "Hey, dinosaurs are not mentioned in the Bible," so how can Bible be correct? There are many things. Even hippopotamus is not mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> Why are we worried? Okay. Doesn't matter. It's, this is not an encyclopedia of all animals and <laughs> plants. Right? So, nothing to worry. We're just saying God created. So there will be many things. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, there may be some uh, or may not some, but there could be lots of questions that people may ask, and we may not have all the answers. That's okay. We don't claim to have all the answers. Right? There are a lot of things God has not revealed to us. So Deuteronomy 29, let's read that. Deuteronomy 29. Twenty-nine. So, you know, there will be questions about creation and things that we see in creation for which the Bible doesn't have answers. And that's okay. The Bible doesn't claim to be, you know, a book with answer to every question. No. Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are secret things which God has. He's kept it for himself. He hasn't revealed it to us. But things which are revealed are for us to follow. So it's okay. Somebody ask, uh, ask about a question, why are there so many stars? What is the use? If you're saying only there are people only on, the, on planet Earth, why did God create so many planets? What is the use? I don't know. Right? I don't know. Why did God create so many stars? You only need one star. I don't know. He created. All I know is He created it. Why He, he did so much? Maybe to show how great He is. But other than that, we don't have answers for every question that people ask. Right? It's okay. Secret things belong to God. What's revealed belongs to us, for us to follow. Also, 
doesn't destroy, doesn't disrupt our faith. Doesn't disrupt. Now, some other questions. Should we use science to interpret the Bible? So this we have to be very careful. Because last time I mentioned how, you know, in science, they have this theory that the universe was created about 14 billion years ago. Earth is 4 billion years old or something like that. And over many, many millions of years, things have evolved. So that is the theory that is generally accepted in the scientific community of how life came into existence. Now, just because we, be, we believe, uh, we are believers and we also accept science, doesn't mean we should take that and put it into the Bible and make the Bible support that. But sadly, some people have done that. So they will take Genesis chapter 1, you know, like I mentioned last time, when it says, on the first day, he created this. That's okay. First day means that is one epoch. It is about so many million years old. And in those so many million years old, this happened. So they are fitting science theory into Genesis chapter 1. Then on day 2, God did this. Ah, Day 2 is not just one 24 hours day. It is so many millions of years old. So like that. And they have written books. And uh, these are all very respected people. They've written books and all they're written. What are they trying to do? They're trying to fit science into the Bible and use science to explain the Bible. That is the wrong thing. And we will not do that. When the Bible says one day, right? it means one day, 24 hours. That's what it means. On this first day, he did this. Don't change it. And we will come, we will explain why we say it is 24 hours. We will explain. That's one separate chapter I kept for that. We'll defend that, no. In Genesis chapter 1, seven, it says six days he created everything. Six days, 24 hour periods. Right? So we should not go to that extent of putting science into the Bible, changing the meaning to adopt to what science and theories in science are saying. We should be careful. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, go ahead, please. So like, you know, sometimes where the Bible is quiet and it's not revealed any uh, particular aspect, it's for us also, it's better not to speculate it further and uh, try to right. get from any external source. Yeah. So when the Bible is quiet, what we should do, one, uh, whatever we say must be consistent with what the Bible does say. So... Uh, so when the Bible is quiet, it means God is saying, okay, you make your right judgment. You make your right decision. And the decision we make, or whatever we say, it should not contradict what has been said in the Bible. That is it. Okay. And we shouldn't, yeah, like you said, we shouldn't begin to speculate in a way that contradicts the rest of Scripture. So this is the best decision we can make. You know, for example, simple, simple. This is this might be a silly example, but cigarettes are not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Cigarette. Okay. So, is it right to smoke cigarette or not? Where it says chapter in show me where it says thou shall not smoke cigarette. <laughs> say, okay, see, it is not written. I know it is not written, but what do we say about that? Whatever we say must be in line with the rest of scriptures. What do the rest of scriptures say? The rest of scripture says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
That is all we can say. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, you want to put smoke in the temple <laughs> and destroy that body? God said, do not destroy the temple. If anyone destroys the temple, I will destroy. So, does cigarette smoke destroy the temple? Smoking cigarette, does it destroy this temple? Yeah, in the box itself, they've said, cigarette smoking is injurious to health. <laughs> They've said it. Huh? Ah, so that is how we, you know, yeah, we know it's not, there's no chapter and verse, but what we say will be in line with the rest of scripture. You make your decision, right? And uh, yeah, things like that. So um, let's come back to this. Should we use science to interpret the Bible? So, one is uh, we use normal rules of language to correctly understand the Bible. So remember, in the Bible, uh, there are different literary styles. And one of the literary styles is to use poetic language. So even we today, when we either write or uh, we speak, we may use similes or we may use phrases or we may use poetic language, which we know we don't take literally. So, example in the Bible, it, it talks about the foundations of the earth. I say, somebody will say, hey, see, Bible is wrong. Where earth has foundations? Earth is not standing on some pillars or anything. Where do you have foundations? Earth is around. You know, it's floating in space, no foundations. So Bible is wrong. No. It is a figure of speech. It is a poetic language. It's not meant to be taken literally. Especially Psalms. A lot of Psalms. There's poetic language. You know. So if we say if we say, Oh, Bible is saying this, it is wrong. No, no, no. Just like you read other things. Here also, you apply the same common sense, right? Same rules. It is poetic language. It's not meant to be literal. It's just saying that it's being firm. It's being upheld. Uh, it's in its place, which is true. It's not going up and down, up and down, floating. No, no, it's, it's like solid. It's in the same place, going around and around. It's like on solid foundation. Actually, there's nothing holding it. But it's like as though it is there, fixed. It's a foundation. So we apply uh, same normal language rule uh, rules of normal language to understand the Bible. So in that sense, yeah, we ap apply understanding or science uh, to uh, the Bible is final authority. Uh, while we welcome scientific discoveries that corroborate the Bible, so uh, we stay with the Bible. And if there are discoveries that are aligned to the scriptures, fine, we accept it. But anything that science says that contradicts the Bible, we leave it outside the Bible. It's okay, that is up to you, your theory, your idea. But this is what the Bible says. We are not going to change the Bible to adopt to scientific theories. Because the reality is these theories keep on changing. And we can't keep on changing the Bible also. We can't do that. <laughs> right? Theories will change. You know? So, Anything that's contradi contradictory or doesn't match with the Bible, you leave it outside. If that's part of the scientific community. Okay, you guys are saying that, fine. But we stay with the Bible. right? And also, our goal is not to fight, but to present truth in love. We saw this passage, 1 Timothy 6, 20, 22, 21 to 22, where Paul says, you know, uh, the servant of the Lord must not get into strife, but be gentle to all men. Be patient. You teach. Right? Uh, in gentleness you correct those who are opposed to the truth so in meekness we and in love we teach and we share ideas we're not here to fight and so on that leads us to another question that is can science explain everything so some people say i say especially you know uh, in uh, science or scientists or people from the scientific perspective uh, they say no see we can explain everything with science but you want bible and we have to pause and make them think. 
Can you actually explain everything with science? There are five basic questions. There are the big questions of life, which science doesn't give us a satisfactory answer. What are those questions? The questions about origin. Where did we come from? So, let us compare what the Christian faith says and what science says for these five big questions. Origin of life, where did we come from? There. It's very simple. Bible says God created everything. And because God created, He created for a purpose. He created for His glory. He created for His pleasure. What does science say? We must have evolved. We're not sure, but this is what we think. The universe must have come into existence because of, you know, we call it a Big Bang Theory. So it's not a statement, it's not an absolute statement. This is what we think, and this is what we think would have happened, maybe. Bible, God created, not God might have created, or God was, could have created, no. God great. Finished. Clear? Absolute. You either take it or leave it. Your choice. So, there is a very clear, absolute, definite, concrete statement from the Bible about the origin of life, the purpose of, and whereas in science, it's like, okay, this is a theory, a hypothesis. We think it's like this and we will work out some calculations, tell you. We are still studying. Identity. Who are we? Who are we? Bible saying we are people made in God's image. It doesn't say that about animals or plants or trees or fish. People. We are created in God's image. Science. We are just a little better than the monkeys or something. You know, we have evolved. We are a little better than them, a little more advanced. We have evolved over time. So, so we're just some step in this whole evolutionary process. What are we going to evolve to next? Who knows? We don't know where we came from. We don't know where we are going. So it's not like science has given us a concrete answer. It's trying to show that we must could have evolved from some predecessor. Right? Number three, why are we here? Meaning of life. Why? Why are we here? Bible is saying we are here to glorify God. We are here to do His will. We are to obey God, love God, serve His purposes. There's meaning that comes through the Bible, the scriptures. Science, figure it out. Find out why you are here. What are you here for? So different people have their own, I'm here to do good, or I'm here to enjoy life, or I'm here to just live and die. Everyone has something. Make up your own thing. But the Bible is very clear. We are here for this reason. We are here to worship God, glorify God, serve His purpose, do His will, obey God, love Him. There's meaning. There's a lot of meaning. Number four, how should we live? Morality. How? The Bible is very clear. This is what you do. This is what's right, what's wrong. But on, on the side of uh, you know atheism or naturalism, you define your own morality. If it's good for you, it's good for you. You define, you decide. But that's also very dangerous because each one comes up with their own idea. And it's full confusion. Full confusion. Oh, so you have to respect my idea. You know, whatever that idea is. Whether it's uh, absurd or right or wrong. Because now morality 
there is no set right and wrong. You define what you want. And lastly, destiny. Where are we going? There's an eternity. Bible is very clear. There is an eternity. You're going to be with God. You'll be separated from God in hell. It's very clear, these things. But uh, atheist success. Nothing more than this. We don't know. Live, die, finished. Naturalism. So when you compare these two, the fact is we cannot answer everything just through science. Science is not giving us a clear, definite, concrete answer to the five basic, most important questions of life. It doesn't. Yeah, it may tell us how, you know, the car works, the airplane flies, and how the bird flies, the fish swims, and how the ship floats. It can explain that. But these important five basic questions, there is no concrete answer. So, science does not have the answer for everything. It has answers for a lot of day-to-day -day things, natural things. But there are other things that science does not have the answer. So, if you want to put it in a, diff in a different way, science can tell us that something is there, but it doesn't necessarily tell us why it is there or how it came to be there. So, example, gravity. Science will tell you, yes, there is gravity. It is like this. You know, it is a gravitational force, 9.8. I should remember my physics now. 9.8 meters per second squared or something. You know, uh, acceleration due to gravity. And it is uniform throughout the Earth, around the Earth. And, Things like that. So it says, okay, the gravitational force is there. Okay, thank you for finding it out. But now can you tell me why is it there? Who put it there? How did it come there? But we don't know. It's there. Who put it there? How it came there? Why is it there? But it is there. So science can tell us the facts, but not necessarily explain the why and the where of where it came from the, you know of these things so it doesn't answer even in in the scientific research itself it doesn't answer everything right so that brings us to the next question has science done away with god I means if you if you know science does it mean you don't need god Now, first of all, we said science does not answer every question. There are five very important questions. Science has no answer to it. Can science do away with God? So what we must understand is that God is not the God of the gaps. That means what science scientists or science would tell is, hey, suppose you don't know, then you say you bring God in there. So God is like a fill in the blanks. When you don't know, temporarily you put God there. Afterwards, once you find out, get God out. Like you fill in the blanks. Whenever there is empty space, put God. So God is like a God of the gaps. Just for filling the blanks. Then when you find the answer, God goes out. No need God. God is not filling the blanks. Right? He is the one who <laughs> beginning and end. Everything. Only our life is small, small, small. But God is... Alpha and Omega. Right? Second, he's not a material God. That means some people say, you know, people in the olden times, when they experienced things more powerful than them, they made it God. Lightning. Lightning was so powerful. They got scared. They said, God of lightning. Thunder. Oh, thunder so powerful. God of thunder. Then rain. Rain was so powerful when it came heavy, they couldn't control it. God of rain. Fire. Fire was so powerful. God of fire. 
But that is not the Bible explanation of God. No. So God is not an idea to explain things that are greater than us. God is the origin of all the things we see. He is the God who created the fire, created the thunder, created the lightning. So he's bigger than his creation. So he's not a material God. And so we don't convert things, material things into God. No, God is the one who created those material things. And last point is, human reason did not create this universe. So we have to be very clear about this. Thank God for science, thank God for reason, but our reasoning did not create. Our reasoning only helped us study what was created. So we can't create. Today, if you want, we can't, we may say, this is how the sun is, it's made up of all these gases, but you can't, can you create a sun? No. You can tell what is in the sun, you can tell all the gas that is in the sun, you can tell what the temperature is, you can tell how far it is, you can tell how hot it is, but can you create sun? No, keep quiet. Can't. We can't create this up. We, we can explain a lot of things with science. But science can't create. We can make things. You know, we can put some things together. You can make tables and chairs and uh, you know, can generate electricity. You can do all these things because we've understood it. But we are not the source. Science is not the source. Science didn't give birth to this universe. Science is a study of the universe. Must be very clear of that, right? So, science, when it's done right, it just leads us to God. Uh, it uh, helps us understand uh, what is there, right? So, science is science the only way to truth? The answer is no. Uh, there are a lot of other disciplines that help us understand a lot of other things that are there, uh, whether it's business history, literature. And so uh, we don't, just because we have, uh, you know, each of these disciplines, we don't say we don't need the other disciplines. So we need all of these disciplines. So science is not everything. It's one of the many disciplines or learning uh, lines that we have. Right? And we said, uh, while science can explain about the how and the what, uh, the purpose and meaning is left answered. There's a lot of noise here. Okay. Uh, let me just pause here and see if there are any questions. Um, just, just a minute, I think. It's too much noise. Um, Okay. A comparative scale. Yeah. Are there a scientist or more scientists who believe in God, or are there more scientists who do not believe in God? Just a. Yeah. So somebody, uh, I forget who did this study, but they uh, they they looked at. I mean, this just uh, we don't know the actual answer, but so the question was, you know, are there more scientists who believe in God or who don't believe in God? So somebody did a, uh, a study of all the Nobel Prize winners, uh, I think uh, specifically in, in the scientific fields. And what they discovered was overall, overall, there's been more scientists who believe in God, who have got the Nobel Prize, as opposed to those who don't believe. And I read that article somewhere, and it's in a book somewhere. That's been, uh, and that study must have been like a couple of years old. So it's not current, but a couple of years. So that's been the trend that there are there are more scientists who do believe in God, as opposed to those who don't. Now, that may change over time, you know, and that doesn't matter, you know. It's it's just cultural shifts that can take place, and it's okay. Yeah. Okay, there are some questions here on the chat. Let me see if I can answer these. Um, Lucy asks, God revealed himself in the creation. How do we help the people who are idolizing creation for their needs, for their needs to be met? Those who are worshiping creation 
for the needs to be met. How do we help the people? Um, that means these are people who are worshipping creation, something that's created. Yeah, I think um, and that's a good question. I'm just trying to think how to answer that. But uh, the thought that comes to my mind is to point them to the limitation of whatever they are worshipping and to point to God who one is, number one, is greater than that creation that they are worshipping. And two, these five big questions that we mentioned, the first five big questions of life, those questions can only be answered by faith in a creator God and not just by faith in a creation or a created thing. Right? So I think if we say, okay, you know, unless you believe in God, you're not going to understand the origin and the meaning and all, all these five things. Uh, this created thing is not going to give us answers to that. So I would look at it from both these perspectives. One is in pointing to the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of God as compared to the created thing, and also answers to these five questions. Okay. Let me take the other one. Um, science is a place where the discovery I mentioned. Science has not created them. Yeah, Daniel. Okay. All right. Um, good truth. Um, do you have uh, a yes, sir, you have Pastor, I just want to say that uh, science believes okay. that man is evolved from apes or monkeys, but there are still monkeys and apes nowadays. Why they are not evolving? Yes. All right. I um. All right, Gertrude, we were not able to hear you. Um, this is on. Can I? Uh, can you hear me, Pastor? Mm. Sorry, something is wrong here. Okay, just go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Pastor? Okay, got Do you want to try one more time, um, so I can? Yeah, hear can you? you hear me faster now? I can hear you. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, my it's not a question. I am saying that if science believes that man evolved from the apes or monkeys, there are still apes and monkeys nowadays. Why they are not evolving into man? Hmm. Right. So, Gertrude has. Uh, what basically saying is, uh, if man believes, I mean, if science says that, you know, man has evolved from uh, monkeys and apes, why is that process not uh, continuing to happen? Yeah, so that's the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's pause for today and we will continue this tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll continue this tomorrow. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless. We'll continue this. And if you have any questions, we'll take it up tomorrow. Thank you. God bless.